Okay, Morgan, are you ready for us to get started? All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Echo Meyer, and I'm currently the um, Vice Chair of Psychological Services in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, but before I took on that um, role, I was for about 17 years or so um, here in the Department of Pediatrics um, uh, as part of the Consultation and Liaison uh, Program with Joni and Sam and, of course, Mary Beth, um, who is our resident expert on stress first aid. And she and I are here with you this morning um, to talk about stress first aid, a model of response um, during COVID-19. Approximately two weeks into the pandemic, um, our chair approached us and asked what we could do, meaning us, meaning the psychology group in um, the Department of Psychiatry, what we could do um, to create a type, a type of response to support health service providers. Um, and um, in psychology, um, in mental health, most of trauma-based work is designed for post-trauma. Um, and so we talk about an event that happened in the past, or um, in a more medicalized setting, we do a debriefing about an event that happened in the past. And so um, we just happened to have Mary Beth in the department and a few other individuals who had been doing a lot of liaisoning work throughout their um, careers. And we decided to try um, to implement something called the stress first aid model um, during a time of the COVID pandemic. Um, and I'm going to spend the front end of this sort of giving you a history of what stress first aid is um, and um, talking a little bit about how we modified it to be implemented within a hospital system and in particular within what the UNC units and groups have asked us for. So I don't know who all is on here, but if um, Julie or Mike or Kenya are on here, um, hello to you all. Um, it's been quite a while since I've seen you in person um, and maybe I'll see you um, on this. Otherwise you'll watch us afterwards when we're being recorded. So thank you to Morgan um, for recording us today. So Mary Beth, since you control the slides, why don't you go on to the next one for us? Okay, so for today's sort of agenda, um, I'm going to again talk about the history of a well being model. Um, and I, um, I can't read my slides because the participant things are up in the front of it, but give me a second. And the chat is up. I should say, please do chat with us. Um, part of my job is going to be after I do this little introduction is to answer questions um, from you all while Mary Beth does the, the bulk of the, the training. And we do want this to be interactive. Um, you can also raise your hand, I guess, in Zoom, and we'll respond to your questions um, that way as well. So don't hesitate as we get into the meat of this to ask questions or offer ideas. Um, but anyway, our um, agenda for today, our overview today, is to start with the history of the model, uh, again, being deployed, a model being able to be deployed during a crisis or an ongoing, ongoing traumatizing experience. Um, we're going to spend a specific amount of time on the discussion of four types of specific health service provider stress focused fatigue. And then we're going to say what Mary and Beth and I call the kind of the meat of the model, um, which is the training today that's going to take place on the assessment or the seven C's. Um, and we're going to tailor, in particular, the assessment based um, SFA um, aspects, um, the, what we call the seven C's, to two particular C's that we feel like will be particularly um, important and relevant to you all. Um, in this audience. And I know that some of you are graduating, and so we wanted to sort of say congratulations um, to those of you who may be listening in or watching this later who are graduating. Congratulations on a graduation, um, even if it's virtual. Um, and we are gonna specifically also for this audience, we don't always do this particular piece of it, but because of where you guys are probably going in your lives moving forward, um, we are going to talk specifically about the way we have been um, thinking a lot about how to do debriefings um, in hospital-based settings um, slightly differently than how debriefings have been historically done. Um, again, with the idea that um, they are more of a process of management of the experience in the present and preparedness for the experience in the future um, if it were to happen again, um, rather than the way that we may be used to do debriefings. And then we're hopefully gonna have some type of general discussion. We know it's difficult over Zoom, but we'll try it anyway. All right, Mary Beth. So stress first aid origin. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna have to read from my slides because things are in front of me. So anyway, stress first aid origin was first developed for the military and it was developed particularly for the Navy. And there's a gentleman named uh, Dr. Richard Westpaw 
um, who was a retired military captain and also a professor of psych psychiatric nursing um, at UVA, is where he was from. And he basically um, is the developer, or one of the primary authors, or multiple people that were developer of the um, um, manual, which is called the Combat and Operational Stress First Aid Caregiver Training Manual, or COPSA manual. And this came about um, in about 2010 after some conversation in the military, as you can see from the quote at the top, that the prevention of mental disorders caused by the stress of military operations was recognized as one of the highest priorities um, of, in particular, again, the Marine Corps and, and, and later uh, the Departments of Defense and Navy. Um, anyway, the COPSA manual was developed to be a flexible, timely way to assess um, military individuals' um, well-being and um, the level of stress. And it is very zone-based, and you'll hear Mary Beth and I talking a lot about moving yourself more towards the green zone, which is a level of optimal functioning or, or feeling as if you are as close to optimal functioning as you can. And the assessment-based um, experiences that you have with your designated individuals are designed to move you more towards the green and away from the more fatigue or um, in need of potentially formal mental health help um, uh, sides of uh, the continuum. Um, so again, that manual is, is, is about 137 pages. It's, it's very visual and very user friendly. And out of that, if you wanna to go to the next page, Mary Beth, um, were developed um, several other, I'm gonna close this part down. I'll, I'll reopen the um, comments section in a second. Um, <clears throat> so out of that kind of model of doing things, individuals, including Dr. Patricia Watson, who is the director of the National Center for PTSD, and several other individuals. Some of these um, workbooks or manuals, as you may call them, have 11 authors on them. So unfortunately, we can't um, right here and now go through all of them. But just know there are a lot of individuals who are very thoughtful about developing these manuals. We have been in the most closest contact with Dr. Watson. Um, she has been incredibly helpful with us in, in, in this <clears throat> and in helping us think about how to modify the stress verdict versions that are available, as you can see, um, primarily for firefighters and then first line or EMS workers. Although it has been adapted for rail workers, some hospitals pre-pandemic, um, wildland and law enforcement and probation. So there already has been a precedent for modifying um, these um, two manuals primarily um, to other settings, but again, not quite in the setting that we are in now. Um, <clears throat> she is currently, um, uh, in this fine to leave that slide, okay, she's currently working on um, I should say, uh, Mary Beth, correct me if I'm wrong about the title. The last title I have is a workbook for health service settings. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, so that's the current title of a workbook that was in in sort of draft form um, prior to the onset of COVID. Um, it is an incredibly um, useful tool. Uh, it's it was developed to be in health settings prior to COVID. Um, and so there's a lot of group-based um, types of ways that the stress first aid was um, going to be done. So we're working to think about the way that that, that can't happen now, um, but m parts of that way of thinking in that specific manual we are um, integrating into the way we're doing this at UNC. If you're interested in watching sort of a longer version um, of just an overview um, of uh, managing healthcare workers' uh, stress, you can go to this particular webinar. Um, there are also going to be several other one-hour webinars on each of the seven keys um, coming up through the Schwartz Center. I believe if you go to the Schwartz Center website, at the top right-hand corner, there's a COVID drop-down menu, and you can see um, what other resources are coming through um, the Schwartz Center um, uh, specific um, to stress first aid and, and to COVID resources. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with the Schwartz Center, you'll know that it is a, it is a unique or um, group of uh, organization that has historically done lots of different things uh, around um, uh, mental health or health care um, workers and interactions with um, patients, essentially. Um, Mary Beth, I don't know if you've described the Schwartz Center in a different or more uh, robust way. Um, sure. I think that, um, so the way that the Schwartz Center came about was that there was a medical provider named Ken Schwartz who himself um, became sick and what he really um, 
realized is that the, the care he received from healthcare providers was more important than he says, you know, the medicine that he received. And he really wanted to make sure that those um, providers were able to take care of themselves and that others were taking care of them. And so the Schwartz Center provides a lot of education to providers. And also there are several things you may see um, in the different places that you go or within UNC called Schwartz Rounds. And so we have pediatric and adult rounds at UNC that are really meant to be a place to reflect on the psychosocial aspects of care. Um, and again, provide a space for providers to reflect on that and support each other. Yeah, and those run on Wednesdays at noon <clears throat> in typical times. Um, yeah. <laughs> for pediatrics, yes. For pediatrics, yes, sorry. Um, okay. So a little bit um, on the next slide is just real briefly, um, this really at UNC has started as a really just a, an, a, an initiative. Uh, people, um, as we said, sort of about a couple of weeks into this, the chair asked us to come in to um, find something to come into the system that was going to be helpful, helpful for health service providers. And about a week later, um, this group of individuals had gotten together from across the hospital from a variety of different places, the emergency department, the MICU, um, a bigger um, parts of medicine, um, of course, um, with nursing and some residents. And I, and I think at least one fellow from the ED is what Daniel's position is. And uh, decided how would we try to begin to implement something like this? How would we overcome some of the obstacles? You know, um, for example, on the MICU, people, you know, kind of locked into certain units and, and um, not being able to have access to each other. and who would want to do something like this? And um, do providers feel like they have the, the quote unquote bandwidth or we use a lot these days to do this type of assessment of their peers? Um, and would they feel like they have the time and energy to get trained um, in something like stress first aid? Um, so at the very beginning, we really had no idea, um, but we decided to give it a try. And um, the, the slide shows that this really has been a ripple effect. We've had no sort of systematic way of doing this. It's one person hears about it, another person hears about it, and another group of people hear about it. And then we are just deployed um, to not to go do trainings. Uh, again, today you're gonna see sort of a, a, a what we call the peer-based peer level of training. Um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what that is, but it has been just a really organic process and we've been really um, happy, I think, Mary Beth, we would say with um, how luckily um, well received this particular model has been. So we're currently in, called the Embedded Support Program. That's what we call it. Um, and it is an embedded system. Um, these are probably not the most up-to-date slide. Um, Mary Beth, we should probably up-to-date it. But this yeah. was <laughs> like as of last week, uh, the places that we were. There are plenty other places we've been since then or, and are going to that since then. And um, we are also currently at a level where if individuals, for example, on the MICU, who are the first individuals that went through this and the ED, um, we are there now, um, they've gone through the larger kind of peer-based training that you all are going to go to, and they have um, health service provider leads, which you'll learn about in a few minutes on their um, floors. Um, those health service provide the leads have approached us to kind of take certain sections of um, the larger model and modify them. And the sections that they're asking us to modify the most um, and to sort of spend more time on are currently less the seven C's for MICU and ED, um, and more on the levels or types of fatigue that Mary Beth is gonna talk about. And I, I imagine we can all imagine why that would be the case. Um, so um, Mary Beth, the next slide I think um, we can go to, and then you can start training these guys. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is the model that we decided to use at UNC. This, this is not, this is, not exactly the model um, that has been used historically in the stress first aid, but this is, um, we've again been in close collaboration with Patricia um, and uh, Mary Beth, you may have even had emails from her last night or today or, or other things. She, she lives in Hawaii, so we do get to talk to her sometimes on the phone, but a lot of times it's, it's electronic conversation. So what we're doing at, at UNC is, is this model. So uh, at the at the beginning, um, there's this idea of what we call it peer support, and by peer support we mean all providers at UNC with an interest in helping others, and they've watched one of these webinars at a minimum. And this is um, a group of individuals like you all will be today who understand the stress first drive model, how to apply it to yourself as you move forward um, in in, um, in medicine, 
and then also to sort of the, the cohort that's um, uh, around you in, in a sort of supportive, peer supportive and, and, and an informal, I guess in some ways we would call it manner. Um, team leads are individuals who have been self-designated uh, or volunteered, um, you might call it um, MDs, NPs, RNs, it could be a respiratory therapist, it could be any individual on a particular unit or division um, or service even. Um, and these individuals receive additional training. They receive training from um, a mental health lead um, that goes beyond the webinars. And in addition, they develop a collaborative um, a relationship with their mental health lead or their MHL, I guess we call them, um, so that as they're implementing uh, stress aid, first aid with their division, uh, they are receiving consultation um, along the way as to have respond at times or to think about different kinds of situations that arise. Um, so again, the team leads have received additional training and also have a they're tagged to a mental health lead. And then we have mental health leads. And these individuals are within the Department of Psychiatry. Um, they're individuals who had a specific amount of type of knowledge coming in. Um, and that primarily was individuals from our consultation and liaison programs, especially individuals who had done a lot of liaison in the past so that they understood the sort of inner workings outside the walls of psychiatry and into the hospital. And also had had a history of whether it be Schwartz, or other types of um, uh, engagements uh, that they had interacted around, um, sort of the well being um, or um, stress related issues um, for individuals um, throughout the hospital. <clears throat> and then, of course, they receive um, stress first aid training at a level that goes um, beyond the other two levels and it involves uh, making sure that you're familiar minimally with, with all of the manuals and then doing a lot of conversation um, with um, Mary Beth. Um, uh, about different types of concerns that they may have. And so that's the model that we've uh, deployed as to use the military term at UNC. And you all are about to um, listen to Mary Beth and I'm gonna start manning the chat um, so that we can get you guys all um, trained at the peer support level today. Okay, Mary Beth, I'm gonna mute myself. All right, so great. So thank you, Echo, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'm excited to talk to you more about this. And when I have been training different groups, the residents, for example, we've talked about how it would have been nice to talk about this even pre-pandemic, right? A lot of these skills, um, even for myself, are helpful to reflect on. And so um, let's pretend the pandemic wasn't here, or maybe that's too hard to do, but think about how you can take these skills with you um, in your everyday practice. So to to introduce myself, so I am a clinical psychologist. I have been at UNC for around 10 years. I started as an intern um, and then completed fellowship and stayed on with faculty. As Echo mentioned, um, we both were in the, or are in, Echo left, but are in the consult liaison role. And so I do a lot within the children's hospital. Hospital. I helped start the pediatric palliative care team many years ago. I work um, as the mental health coordinator for the CF um, pediatric program, work with the Beacon team, which is our child abuse team, um, and oh, heart and lung transplant. So I do a lot of different things within pediatrics. And through that, often I'm doing formal and informal support to healthcare providers. And you can imagine in a bunch of those settings, there are some really difficult um, cases that people are coping with and so important that we provide that support. Um, I have this first uh, picture up here because I encourage you to think about how you might relate to this. It was done by an artist in Spain when he thought about um, the superhuman worker, superhero status of many healthcare providers and thought about this wave of COVID and how it may be feeling overwhelming to some and how we are kind of battling it with whatever we have, whether it's an umbrella or our bare hands. And so thinking about you and your training and what you've observed or what you've heard about on the news, where you yourself feel like you are, um, and maybe sometimes you feel like the wave is crashing down or you are hopeful that the wave is receding and so just thinking about that for yourself. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit. Some of this is from the webinar, so you'll see on the bottom that we are giving credit as much as we can to Dr. Watson, um, again, with the National Center for PTSD, who helped develop this. But I want to talk to you about some guiding ideals, or what we call values. Um, within psychology, these are really important to people. It's what often um, helps you decide what 
um, career that you want to follow. It helps you feel happy when you're living in line with your values. It also can motivate you to change so that you are living in line with your values. And these are wonderful ones on here. You'll see that on the left, it um, talks about why these are a strength. And on the right, talks about how they could set you up for vulnerability. And that's pre-pandemic and also during the pandemic. So I'll point out a few of them to you and think about if you can relate to these or not. The first in pink at the top being selflessness. So this idea of placing the welfare of others above your own. Um, and so a lot of you within healthcare, you're doing this every day, every minute. You are taking care of others instead of yourself. And important that you think about that balance. Um, there are a lot of providers who may say, you know, every day I'm telling people, make sure you get your annual physical or make sure you get X, Y, and Z. And then you ask those providers, when the, was the last time you did that? And they're like, oh, I don't know, maybe five to 10 years ago, right? I think we're um, guilty of that as mental health providers too sometimes, right? As we might say, have you done X, Y, and Z? And then our, ourselves not following our own advice, we might say. Um, so thinking about that value or ideal. In green is moral code. Um, so we'll talk about this one because it's been a big topic for a lot of people during this time. So it's the idea of feeling like maybe there's you, this internal compass of what is right and what is wrong. And so you're brought to healthcare but perhaps because you feel like it's something that people should receive and there's um, a reason that it's right to help people who are in need. And what is really hard is that sometimes we are trying to think about um, how we might triage resources or we're hearing about in the news how that's happening. I am also on the ethics committee at UNC and so was on a reading group thinking about what might might be our plan if we got to that level. And so you're feeling frustrated or when you see others who perhaps aren't following the same code or when you're hearing about that, you know, not just at UNC, but in the world. And then the last I'll point out is excellence. And this is this idea of trying to be your best, most effective self. Now, I think for a lot of people who are perhaps in medicine or just high achieving in general, this is one to be aware of because, you know, I will blame my parents when I was growing up and A minus was not excellent, right? And A was excellent. And so, um, sorry, parents. Um, but so, you know, this idea of wanting to strive to be the best you could. And so feeling ashamed when you weren't that top level of functioning. Um, but important to think about, is that truly possible? Um, I know some people have said, okay, we're in a pandemic. And so might we might say, you're allowed to function at 50%. Like that's actually excellent during this time. That can feel very relieving for some people, right? It feels very relieving to me to think I don't have to be teaching my five-year-old all of the things she might be missing in school and I can be 50% parent. But then there's also a lot of guilt that comes with that. And a lot of healthcare providers saying things to me like, well, wait a minute, I work in an ICU or an emergency department. I can't be at 50%. So this big struggle over this value of excellence and this idea of not being able or feeling um, like it's hard to meet that ideal. The next thing which Echo alluded to is this idea of stress injury. So when you all think of post-traumatic stress disorder or you think of trauma, you probably often think of the one on the far left, this idea of life threat, um, a traumatic injury. So often thinking about um, a trauma or a threat to life to yourself or to someone else. Um, that is happening during this time, but there are a lot of other their stress injuries that are happening that are important to acknowledge. Um, the first being loss, and really a better way to kind of um, uh, describe this as a grief injury. And again, this doesn't just mean the loss of people, although that is very important to acknowledge and um, very devastating at this time, right? Thinking of the number of people who have died um, as related to this, and not just from COVID, right? But lots of people who aren't seeking health care and are dying of other causes. There are a lot of other things people are grieving, right? The loss of normalcy, the loss of going to um, shop, or the loss of sending your kids to daycare. Um, you know, and so important to acknowledge all those things and not say to yourself things like, well, I can't grieve that because people are dying. Right? Um, so allowing yourself to have a moment where you acknowledge those things that you're grieving um, and, and think about them for a minute. 
Inner conflict or moral injury is what I mentioned before. Again, this idea of struggling over what feels right versus wrong and feeling very upset when you feel like that isn't met or you see a lot of wrong happening in the world. And wear and tear. I think this is something a lot of people can identify with. I myself can identify with. Um, and another way to describe this is a fatigue injury. Um, so it's the idea of over time, all of the stress accumulating and feeling like, when am I gonna get a break? When am I gonna get a chance to rest and recover so I can be ready to go back in to do this again? It'd be one thing if somebody said, in a month, you get a big time to rest and recover, right? Or um, the pandemic will be over at this time. For you guys, you may also think of um, residency or medical education in general as fatiguing, right? And so when do I get that break? Um, I know a lot of residents will say things like, I thought that light at the end of the tunnel is maybe when I am an attending, right? Um, but allowing yourself time throughout your training to stop, to reflect on the fatigue that might be kind of building and that is particularly re relevant during this time. So this is a really important part of the model and something if you take away one or two things, something to maybe keep in your mind and it's called the stress continuum model. Remember this was developed in the military so some of the language you're gonna see up top is very military based. So you think about what, how you might label these and maybe it's just based on the color. But at the left you see green, and what they call ready. So ready to jump in, to go perform your daily tasks. Under green, you'll see things like you are, well, you're um, feeling motivated, calm, focused, you're feeling kind of at your optimal functioning. Yellow is called reacting. So often that's when there's a stressor. Now, important to note that not everybody jumps to yellow just because there is a stressor and that there are lots of different stressors people are um, facing. So a pandemic may be a stressor for many, but may not be for others. So important we, that we don't over pathologize how people are reacting, but we also think about all those other stressors people may be experiencing that could be related to the pandemic or could be related to medical school, for example, or could be related to your family or to all kinds of different things. Notice as you go from green to red, symptoms are starting to increase, becoming more severe. So in yellow, it's kind of this mild and transient distress, this irritability, trouble sleeping. Um, and then as you go to orange and red, you're feeling less like yourself. So in orange, they call it injured. Um, you'll see under causes are those four types of distress I mentioned. So this life threat, this loss or grief, moral injury, and wear and tear. Uh, and so you're really starting to feel like one of those or many of those are really starting to affect you and feeling like your symptoms are more severe and persistent. And then red zone, if we call it that, is where you feel ill, um, which again, I'm not sure I really like that language, um, but is where mental health providers might be diagnosing things like PTSD or depression. And these symptoms are really persistent. And if you think about within our DSM for mental health providers, we are looking for um, these symptoms are really impairing you in multiple settings. So not just, for example, at work, but also at home. Um, and so what I often want people to be aware of is the fact that these zones change frequently. So for yourself, if you thought about where you, all to, where you are today, take a minute to do that. And then think about where you were a week ago. Or an hour ago or where you think you might be on your first day of residency or your last day of residency, right? Or your first day in an ICU setting. So notice that those can change. Now, if I asked you where you think you should be as a graduating medical student or where you should be as an intern versus a third year, resident. 
there's sometimes a lot of pressure or stigma we put on ourselves about where we think we should be. And this happens not just for medical providers, but for military providers, for basically every person who exists. There's a lot of pressure we put on ourselves. When I've asked different groups, where should you be? Sometimes they'll hem and haw and say, well, actually I want a bigger rainbow. Can I, I want a color between here. I want one between green and yellow. I think that's where maybe I should be. Others saying, I don't believe green exists, right? Or, um, you know, so thinking about in mental health, we talk about shoulding ourselves and how that's not really helpful. Um, and instead what can be, um, helpful is to just acknowledge where you think you are, to reflect on what you're experiencing, to think about why you might be there, and where and how you might move up and down that continuum. This is a peer support model, and so we encourage that because you are probably going to know your peers better than people like me or Echo, even if we work with you, right? You're going to know your group of med students, your group of residents better than even some of your supervisors. And so helpful for you to know, oh, I think this peer is often in the, I don't know what's between green and yellow, but this, I don't know, this zone between green and yellow, right? And so when you see them going to orange, you yourself might think, maybe I say something, right? Or if you yourself know I'm generally yellow zone, right? But I'm feeling a change. Um, acknowledging that and thinking about what is it that might be making that difference today. The, just so you know, the pediatric residents have really liked this and have considered um, putting this up in bathrooms, right, to remind each other. Other people have joked we get stickers in the hospital sometimes based on when you were screened, I think, and, and when your temperature was last checked. And they said, what if we all just wore colors of where we are on the continuum? What would that be like to say to everyone, I'm orange zone today, right? And does that mean give me extra support? Or does that mean stay away from me because I'm really grumpy, right? But Anyway, something to think about. All right, so here is what we joke is the meat of the model, the seven C's of stress for state. My corny joke for you, right, is this was developed in the Navy, and so we're traveling the seven C's together. Um, the first two, check and coordinate, you'll notice are throughout this little um, circle. And these are things that you're probably doing for yourself or perhaps not, um, and for your peers on a, on a somewhat frequent basis. Check is that you're observing and listening for um, changes in people's behavior or kind of what they're saying. And coordinating is getting help as you need it. And that may be going to your chief resident, for example, or going to advisors um, who are faculty. Um, or it could be thinking about resources that are available within your institution or outside of your institution. And we'll talk about some of those available at UNC. And then three through seven are, um, these five are kind of what research has shown are what people really need when they are in situations of ongoing trauma, ongoing exposure to threat. Um, and there isn't, unfortunately, a perfect formula of what you need. So I can't tell you you really need, you know, 50% calm and 20% confidence. Um, what you need may be different from what your peers need. What we have talked about with different groups is which of these C's might be most affected for you and why, where might it be helpful to pay more attention. And so Echo mentioned for you all as trainees who are still learning a lot of information, number six and seven are ones we're gonna talk a little bit more about with you. Um, but for your, you or yourself, you may say, actually, um, what I need more of is number four. I'm just gonna throw out one. So I'm gonna, just briefly tell you what they are and then we're going to go through each of them together. So number three is cover. Some people don't like this language in healthcare setting, but in military it's the idea of right, take cover, so keep yourself safe. Um, number four is calm and that's referring not only to um, you know um, your mind but also your body and thinking about how those are related. Number five is connect, so connecting with peers, with family for support. Number six is competence, which is self-efficacy. And number seven is confidence, so this sense of self-esteem and hope for the future. 
So the way these slides are set up is I'm going to show you kind of what's from the manual first, and then I will show you what we're doing at UNC or how we are teaching it at UNC and go through each of them that way. So check again, we mentioned is the idea of looking, listening, keeping track of changes and thinking about what zone you may be in and what zone your peers might be in. So at UNC, when we're training, we're um, talking to people about doing those exact things, that this doesn't need to be a formal assessment kind of checklist, right? We're not giving people necessarily a PHQ-9 or a GAD-7 and saying, fill this out for me and let me total your score, but noting that it can be done in small ways and that it's ongoing. And then we're recommending that people kind of put together what's in green and what's in orange. So you're stating what you've observed and then why you're concerned. Sometimes why it's helpful to put those two together is because people, you know, myself included, might be defensive sometimes. If, if someone said even something like, I've noticed you've seemed a little more blah, blah. And so helpful to say, hey, I really care about you. I'm worried, um, or I, think you're really important to our team. I have observed that you seem a little more X, Y, and Z. And so you're kind of pairing it, not that you're sugarcoating it, but you're telling someone why you're telling them what you've observed. The second one is coordinate. So again, the idea of thinking about where and how you can get additional support for people when you feel like it might be helpful. And this can be, they say chain of command. So think about in a medical setting, what that means, how that's different from chain of command in military. But the, again, might could be people like chiefs, um, faculty advisors, for example. And then they also talk about within peers and, and family and then referrals as needed. So we've things we are encouraging or asking people if they'd like help finding resources. For some people in pediatrics and, and adults as well, it's helpful to actually offer them the chance to sit with you and make an appointment. So saying, let me sit with you and I'm gonna dial the number, right? Now, this is not you forcing um, them to seek mental health care. Often that is not helpful. But I've known some people who say, hey, I really want you to at least meet a mental health provider or make an appointment and you can cancel it later, right? Let me help you do that. Because jumping that, making that first step is often really hard and easy to say, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. Um, so can be nice to have extra support in that. And then I need to update this. I apologize with what's in orange, but we have several resources at UNC, including uh, Echo, you have to help me. It's called a Helping Hands Line. Yeah, we've, okay. we've, uh, just real quickly, things have changed rapidly as everything else has. So we are no longer um, necessarily doing things through occupational health, just for ease of access. And so we've developed, for example, um, the H3 line, which is um, basically a, a call-in line um, for individuals, completely private. It's throughout the entire healthcare system. Um, we had nurses calling from Rockingham um, on day one. And it is um, a conversation, short-term consult um, with a licensed um, clinician through our department. And of course, we've always had what we call TCOO, one more O, uh, which is the taking care of your own program, which is, I always I think about taking care of our own, right? Um, so it is, yeah, but it is um, a, more of a formalized relationship with, again, a private, especially uh, designated person from the Department of Psychiatry for a more of a one-to-one -one relationship, so a little bit more than um, the H3 line. And so those are two of, two of the um, primary things we would highlight here today um, that are being utilized um, by health service providers uh, have been um, uh, and are being utilized by healthcare providers. And that is through the Department of Psychiatry. There are other um, resources and support groups that are being run through the Department of Psychiatry as well that are specifically um, designed and designated for individuals who are health providers, including um, a whole initiative on um, providers who are parents. Um, so there's a lot going on at UNC, um, and you can find it through the Department of Psychiatry website or through the UNC Healthcare Wellbeing website. And then Mary Beth, there's a couple of things that are more national that I think are also on your slide. Yeah, absolutely. So some of these other things during this time, there are a lot of um, apps or other resources that are free to healthcare providers. Um, and so some of those are listed on here and things that we can help you get access to. Headspace is an app. Face COVID is a type of um, 
uh, therapy called ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, that has been helpful for, for many. And as Echo said, a lot of these changing um, as we continue to meet the needs of healthcare providers and think about what's most helpful. So cover, again, is the idea of staying safe and so helping people in the moment and also in general feeling protected, feeling like um, they there is this idea of safety uh, and reduced kind of fear of danger. So we talk about a lot of people are worried not only about their own personal safety, but their family's safety, right? What might I be bringing home, for example? Um, we're talking about both physical acts you can do to help you feel safe. And it's interesting, you know, we talk about how a lot of that is actually physically covering yourself during this time, right? Putting on PPE. And so reminding yourself that this is one way you are helping yourself feel safe. And then also psychological reminders about there's so much that's in your control and focusing on the present as opposed to worrying about in three weeks, will we still have um, masks, for example. And green is the idea of for those people who are leaders or for you all to feel like you can go to your leaders and say, I don't feel safe and I want your help, you know, changing that um, so that that sense of, um, I'm trying to think of the word, that sense of safety within that relationship exists um, and that even if you're worried about something happening, at least you're able to go to people and talk about your worries. And then in orange is this idea of personal safety and making sure that you're listening to your peers and that supervisors are also listening out to you all for any concerns about personal safety and making sure we're, we are seeking emergency services um, if those comments or thoughts do come up for anyone. Calm, again, we're thinking about how we are um, fostering that, whether it is, again, at work, outside of work, how we are doing this physically and emotionally. So really focusing on the mind-body connection. Um, oftentimes for those of you who um, have some anxiety and many times lots of high achieving people do have some anxiety, right? There are positive um, side effects or of anxiety motivates you to study um, for boards, right? To um, get up early and come to your um, classes to be on time for different rotations, uh, but it also can have a big effect on your body, right? And so your heart racing, you breathing fast. So thinking about how those are connected and how you're going to calm both of them. And these are some questions you can ask yourself in orange as well as your peers about how are you relaxing your mind and your body, distracting yourself? How are you getting enough rest? And then the last question, would you like any more resources? Is something we put in here because I think some people are quick to say, oh, you have a problem, let me help you solve it, right? You don't feel calm, let me teach you this mindfulness technique, right? Or have you tried deep breathing? And those are very helpful techniques and things that we encourage people to try, um, but not always helpful when that is our immediate response. I know when people tell me, take a deep breath or just stay calm, sometimes my response is, okay, get out of my face, right? I'm joking with you guys and I can't see your responses, so hopefully you're smiling. Um, but important for us to kind of be with someone while they're expressing this and then thinking together about, I wonder if you want help seeking resources to help with that. So connect is how you're with people when you are physically able to be with them, but also when you're not and how you're fostering this sense of connectedness and reduced isolation. And for people that has also been how you're connecting with your patients during this time, because for many that is what um, even pre pandemic, a lot of people have missed or miss um, when they are in certain settings and feel really raced or pressured right to do different um, tasks. And so how are we going to to encourage that connection with patients with each other. I like to point out here three different types of um, support that you can provide to each other um, during this time and thinking about for you you, which one, a joke, which one of these is your support love language, right? Which is most helpful for you? Which one do you think might be most helpful for your peers as you get to know them? The first is instrumental support. So thinking about daily tasks. And there are two ways to ask about this or to offer support to someone. One is what can I help you with today? Or, or would it be helpful if? 
So that's wonderful to hear. And many of us might say, yes, could you please X, Y, and Z. For some though, if we go back to that idea of stigma, right, it might feel hard to accept support. And so it might feel easier to say, oh no, no, I'm fine, thanks so much, when really you feel like you're drowning under that COVID wave, right? And yes, you need as much help as you can, but you think ah, everyone else is doing fine, everyone else is handling, you know, intern year fine, so I should be able to too. Um, and so important that you keep that in mind, right? And when people offer support, think about why they're offering, you know, it's not because they think they're better than you, or they think you can't handle things, but because they want to help. And then the second part being, might it be more effective if somebody said to you, I want to do this for you today, or I'm going to do this for you today. Um, and, and so I'm going to write this note. I'm going to do this new admission, right? Now, important that you yourself think about, is that something you can do, right? Do you have the bandwidth? Do you have the time to do it? And so what are small types of instrumental support you could provide? This in general is most well received by people. Um, now, a lot of that research is military, and I'm not gonna stereotype why they think instrumental support is most effective or helpful, but keep that in mind and think about ways that you can offer that and receive that type of support. Informational support, um, there are lots of things out there saying, you know, you should limit your amount of time that you are learning about COVID or learning about different things um, that might be overwhelming or stressful for you. Uh, and so thinking about, is it helpful for me to read four hours worth of information, is 30 minutes better? Should I read this one summary, email, watch this one news show, for example? Emotional support is what we often think about when we think of connectedness, this idea of do you feel a sense of community within your class, within your um, organization? How are you connecting with them and with your family and friends? It feels completely different when it's on a computer screen, right? I'm connecting with you via, you know, a camera, I can't see you um, right now. So how, well, how does that feel like? Um, and how are you encouraging each other through this? So then competence and confidence, watching time. We wanted to spend a little extra time and we'll, maybe we'll open this for conversation at the end. But confidence again is this idea of self-efficacy. Um, for a lot of people who are feeling less experienced, who are under a lot of stress and are performing new skills, they may feel a decrease in competence. So again, pre-pandemic, medical students, interns, residents in general may, may identify with this. And I have heard this from people even who are um, attendings, right? Or who are in different professions. So important to reflect on that. Also think about though how competence isn't just for people in work duties, but also in different domains. So thinking about for yourself, if right now medicine is where you're feeling most worried about competence or if it's in other domains and what is that's going to be like for your peers as well. In orange are great ways for you to build others' competence and your own competence. And this isn't for you to just give kind of false praise, um, but for you to kind of point out to others how um, you feel like they are really helping your team and what unique skills you think they're bringing. Uh, as a pediatric psychologist, so I often point out that it's helpful when we teach parents to give specific labeled praise. So hearing good job from supervisors or from your peers is helpful and makes some people feel really great, but we're more likely to internalize and really feel um, motivated when we hear specific labeled praise, right? So instead of somebody saying, good job doing I don't know, intubating this patient, right? It's helpful when somebody says, I really like how you um, handled that stress. First you came to me, then you blah, 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 right? So you're kind of detailing out for someone what they did. Um, as parenting, we talk a lot about, um, let's say your child builds a block tower. So great job is your response when your kid shows you this, as opposed to, I really like how you put the green block on top of the blue block, you use all of them and you, I don't know, didn't ask me for help or something like that, right? So you're being very specific in what you observed and what they did. And so they're really able to internalize how proud you are and um, as opposed to this good job. 
And then the last one that um, of these seven C's is confidence. So trust, hope, self-worth, self-esteem, and meaning. So questions to ask yourself and others, what are you hoping for in general? Do you believe in yourself to make it through internship, through residency, through your career as a physician? Um, importance of focusing on moments, realizing certain things that brought you to medicine or that keep you in medicine may change, your values may change, right? And so having time to reflect on those as you continue your journey. And then thinking about meaning making during these times. Now that doesn't mean I'm telling you to find a reason for things, right? That there's a reason for why someone dies. There's a reason that this pandemic is here. There's a reason for X, Y, and Z. But you to find meaning in moments. You know, the meaning for you has been in spending more time in nature, has been in other kinds of, of, of situations. So lots of pros of this model that you're able to get peer support, fostering connectedness within your peers, that it's very flexible. So in all the different places we've gone, they've all kind of wanted adapted, to adapt this differently. Um, but in UNC, again, this idea of we're adding this extra layer of mental health support within the Department of Psychiatry so that we are there as kind of your backup to check in with people um, who are identified as these kind of medical team leads to make sure that they feel like um, they're able to provide that support and that um, they can problem solve different ways to continue to integrate the model. The other thing we wanted to talk quickly about are groups or debriefings. Some of you may have been exposed to these during medical school. Uh, they can be really helpful. So if we think about medical debriefings like a, I, um, an m and M, so a morbidity and mortality as a debriefing, as opposed to a debriefing after your entire experience in the PICU. So I do those often with um, our pediatric chaplain where we think back on your month in the ICU and what was challenging, what was rewarding, what are you gonna take with you? That's different from us thinking about this trauma that occurred with this one patient and what do you remember and how did you feel and what did you see? Um, it's also different when that trauma has ended and now we are in a different place as opposed to right now, us being in kind of this continuous exposure to high stress level, high trauma, right? And when I say that, meaning the pandemic, many of you feel may feel like residency in general is high exposure to high trauma and stress. So there has been a lot of research talking about sometimes debriefings can be not helpful or traumatic to um, participants. So really important that you think about how those are facilitated and what goes on during those times. So these are some examples of how you might integrate the model into those settings and different questions that we hope people might include in there. So how are we maintaining calm after this event that we've experienced? How are we still instilling confidence in each other, hope for you know next week, but I don't have in here, I don't think, no, I'm sorry, are things that we encourage, um, we've been encouraging people within the hospital not to do during debriefings. And those are things like having people um, go through all the details, what we might call a trauma story about what happened, making sure that people have access to providers like mental health providers to do that if that feels therapeutic, but that we are protecting each other's emotions. And again, not re-traumatizing or traumatizing um, each other. So that's just a quick discussion of debriefings. No, I, to be aware of that. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I just wonder if you and to say that that I would just we've been incredibly impressed with the creativity about the way some of the units have been um, uh, um, creating space uh, for a different type of conversation and a different kind of um, remembrance of patients and recognition of each other during um, debriefings um, and utilizing sort of this different type of um, kind of approach that's more um, specific to sort of how you are currently acknowledging what the loss was, but then more specifically, how are you coping? Where are you on this continuum with the idea that, um, you know, fatigue is, is at play and is going to continue to, to you know, to plague people uh, moving forward. And so um, this has been really uh, just wonderful in terms of the creativity of the providers at UNC. Um, in the places that Mary Beth and SFA have been implementing a slightly different way to think about debriefings. 
So yeah, we're not going to talk more about that, but I did want to put it out there. And thank you for putting that slide in, Mary Beth. I think we probably are getting to the end of our time and um, we can go, I think, to our last slide. Our last um, slide, yes. Um, so this was just me acknowledging all those people, particularly within our leadership. So that includes Echo on here, right? As well as um, Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody, who is the chair of psychiatry and then our pediatric CNL team. And again, Dr. Watson at the National Center for PTSD, as well as all of you who are um, healthcare providers out there, um, regardless of where you are in your training for everything you are doing already, um, your dedication to learning more and what you will do in the future. So I guess we have, what, five minutes for any questions that maybe came in the chat? Um, and Echo, I will let you facilitate. Yeah. Or I, was, I was smiling because, um, you know, I'm up there with the leadership, but I'm really, <laughs> I've been with you Mary Beth me. no, <laughs> for a long time when she was an intern and a fellow, and we have had an office in the medical school wings down the hall from each other for a long time. Um, and then Joni McKeeman has, has been across the hall from us in the medical school wings for a long time. Um, so this has been a group so far that's been rolling out uh, Stress First Aid that have um, been together for a long time. So um, we've done really well during this presentation, not using any of our bad humor, um, <laughs> but um, we have a long history of that. Um, but thank you for acknowledging um, the leadership, especially the chair, Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody, for um, look, looking forward um, into the future to thinking about something like this was going to be needed. Um, and of course, thank you, Mary Beth, um, for the quick way you brought it on and um, all the different ways the rapid nature of, of this has been deployed. Um, so this is a pretty quiet group. I don't see anything in the chat, but I don't know if anybody wants to um, uh, make, write a comment now or raise their hand and, and um, ask a question. We'll, we'll kind of sit here for a minute or two and see if that happens before we sign off. And um, it might be that I have to go to manage participants. Um, so a question is, um, if someone is in the orange zone uh, of the stress continuum model, what are the best ways to help them move uh, to the other um, and you know, towards the green, Mary Beth? And so I'll let Mary Beth talk more, but um, you know, so what we presented with you mostly here today is the way to assess um, using the seven C's, you know, where a person is so that, you know, um, and identifying um, which of the seven C's is, is most impacted or is, or, is, or is feeling the worst um, and identifying which is the most important to the provider. So identification and assessment is the first step. And then there are really individualized ways that you would move someone based on, for example, if confidence um, was the areas of, of greatest harm at that point in time, how would that particular individual focus on um, with themselves and with others? Um, rebuilding or building or recognizing how to pay attention to that particular skill to move them closer towards um, a more feeling as if they're in a more optimal level of functioning. But Mary Beth, what else would you kind of talk about in terms of what to do when you recognize that somebody is in a zone that's a little bit away from optimal functioning? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And Echo, I appreciate your answer because there isn't a, there's a slide that I don't have up here where it kind of shows that it's so individualized, right? And so for someone, like you said, it might be confidence that is they're kind of feeling like and that's underneath this model, right? That is pushing them to the orange zone for someone It may be all five of those kind of core components. And so we also don't want you to feel as a peer that that is your primary job, right? It can also be that you're helping them seek additional support and thinking about what resource, what other resources might help them. Um, and, and again, realizing that that may be very individualized. Um, yeah, we don't have that slide up there, but as you said, there's one, there is a way some, you know, somebody might have a slight injury in all five, right? And somebody might have a, a large, um, you know, injury in, in one of the seven, right? And so assessing sort of not only what, but also how much. And then one of the things I've heard you say before is sort of what some injuries will be, um, or some kind of um, uh, experiences will be more injurious, I guess, than others. You know, the loss of, of confidence may be really important to uh, one person, but while for another person, the loss of calm may be incredibly important to them. So it's just in, highly individualized. And I think that's why kind of assessing in such a broad way um, and recognizing that there is no one way um, that a person may need help or 
help themselves be able to move back towards the green. Right, and so specifically, if we were talking about mental health interventions, right, for someone who is who is ha troubling, having trouble with calm, it may be things like, you know, I mentioned um, things like mindfulness or relaxation or those types of skills as opposed to um, something that was more focused on competence. But I think it's a great question and I think it, it may start with having a conversation with someone, right, about again, I really care about you, I'm worried that I've seen a change in how you're doing, what do you think, right, as being kind of a first step. And um, I'm worried about kind of what you're saying, I'm worried about you um, becoming more stressed. How can I help relieve some of that? Um, so I hope that wasn't too round of, about, about, of, of an answer to that, but I think it's a great one to think about on an individual level. Any other yeah, questions think, or comments? Oh, sorry. No, I don't see anything else in the chat, and I think we're probably getting close to the time, but I do want to just emphasize that um, that this model, um, uh, you know, is incredibly um, individualized and I hope resonated um, with many of you today and at least parts of it resonated with many of you today. Uh, again, if you want more information on sort of the model itself or how to do um, some of the more specifics, um, this is usually a one to three day training. Um, so some of the questions like that question, if we were in a one to three day training, um, we would be able to spend more time on, um, but we've tried to, we've done this in um, about, 54, 55 minutes. So again, go to the Schwartz Center if you want additional um, kind of information or contact um, one of us um, and we can kind of talk a little bit further, especially if you want to potentially go beyond um, the, poor, the peer support level uh, of the model. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much thank for coming today. Thank you all today. for what you do. We really enjoyed talking with you. Hopefully enjoyed some of our humor. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were good today. We toned it down, right. <laughs> Have a great one. Congrats to those of you who are graduating. Thanks. Thanks.